Um, hi everybody, my name is Lanriana and you can just call me Lani. And today I'm holding a wonderful lecture about my semester abroad in Indonesia. And I want to mention that that was kind of my... <laughs> and that, that was kind of a dream of mine since I was small. Since I was in the primary school, I dreamt of going to Indonesia, of living there, of learning the language. And the reason is that I'm half Indonesian, half German. And that dream came true last year. And yeah, I will tell you a couple of stories about that. So what am I talking about? Um, those who maybe got an email or looked at Instagram, they read this um, text of mine. Iswi Efau invites you on a time travel back to the last semester. One girl, one country, one aim, studying and be a student on in Indonesia. Um, yeah, that's more or less the topic. Um, and the thing is, I can't tell you everything. I can't tell you all my experience I did in Indonesia. It was half a year full of experiences. And that's why I have to somehow compromise it and just tell you a couple of things. So those are the things which I will not tell you about, but also what I will tell you about. So I will tell you about my university, Universitas Atmajaya Yogyakarta, UAJE. And my student organization, I joined, Palava and Taekwondo. So um, it might seem a bit boring, but I promise you it was quite adventurous. So just be open to it and listen to my um, presentation. So where are we? Me, I'm now here and I guess that most people who are now joining this presentation are also here. And we are going here to Indonesia. Um, in Jogja, it's five hours ahead. So um, I guess that a couple of friends of mine in, from Indonesia are now joining. So th in that case, um, they are now um, already starting midnight there. And where are we exactly? We are in Jogja. Um, Jogja is a town on the island Java. You can see it here on the um, on the map, and it's situated on the island Java, and it's also called Kota Mahasiswa. Kota Mahasiswa is translated in Indonesian, Bahasa Indonesia, uh, the city of students. And the reason is that there are really a lot of students and a lot of universities in um, Jogja. It's around hundred thousand or even more students are just in that city, and. The third thing I want to add is that Jogja is a sultanate. Um, there are actually two sultanates in the whole um, country, Indonesia. And that shows that Jogja is somehow from political and historical importance. But I don't want to tell you about the whole history and the political situation about Jogja, but about my university. So here we are, um, Universitas Atmajaya Jogjakarta. And this university has with our university in uh, Ilmenau a cooperation, a partnership. And that's the reason why I went there. And the funny thing is I went there and the first thing they asked me was, ah, you're from Ilmenau, right? Um, do you know the ISV? And I was just, um, yeah, kind of was a bit involved in it. <laughs> so um, for those who know me a bit better, I was um, one of the board members. So that was a quite funny question that they asked me. Yeah, do you know the ISV? It, for me, it was obvious. Yes, I know the ISV. And that shows also that the ISV has somehow quite big influence that, in, um, that the first question they asked me is, do you know the ISV? Yeah, furthermore, um, this university is a Catholic university. And it's also regarded as one of the best six universities in whole Indonesia, according to the Directorate of Higher Education Department of National Education. Um, you can also read it in Wikipedia, by the way. Um, but that's also one fact which um, a lot of students are proud of. And Atmajaya has four campuses, and I was having classes in two of them, and those two you can see on the right hand side. So I went there and um, I want to just tell you something about my top three I had to get used to. Um, some people might think, oh, maybe culture or language. Actually, that was no problem for me. I had other problems, which you can already see on the pictures. Um, the biggest problem was the AC. <laughs> uh, 
um, I was not used to this coldness. It was really hot outside. And then we went into the classrooms or, the, or into my room and it was just cold. <laughs> And actually, I also caught a cold immediately. So I got sick and I think at two or three times I got sick only because of the coldness. Um, yeah, <laughs> so that was the first thing I got to get used to. And the second thing um, are the motorbikes. Uh, I live here in Inelmenau and they are not really motorbikes. I didn't see even one motorbike on the streets, to be honest. And there were, in, in Jogja, there were motorbikes everywhere. And almost each student has a motorbike. And they were really using those motorbikes. Even if they have to just drive half a kilometer, they use their motorbike to go to the, to the university. Um, for me, I walked or I used my bicycle. Uh, a lot of students uh, found it somehow funny that I used my bicycle or walked in that heat. It was really hot, around always over 30 degrees. And at the end, I also learned how to motorbike with my friend Monang. And the third thing I had to get used to was the food. Um, I love Indonesian food. I love rice. I love spicy stuff. I love somehow everything there. Um, it was just too tasty. So I really had to learn and get used to not eat too much and to get somehow chubby and so on. Actually, I got chubby at the beginning, but then I joined a couple of sports um, sessions with Taekwondo and uh, that was also a good idea. <laughs> yeah, so that are my top threes. And I want to tell you about my life um, since it's somehow also connected to the university. The university gave me a buddy, one person who helps me to somehow um, get used to the living situation and he also helped me to look for placement uh, to find a place where I can stay and he helped me to find my place uh, at the end I was living here the Pringodani stay and the nice thing or the um, extraordinary thing about that is that this Pringodani stay has this idea to have a green business, to be sustainable. They had um, furniture out of selected legal sustainable forests from West Java. They had solar lights up on their roof um, so that the water is getting heated by solar energy. And they had everywhere tropical plants. And that's not usual. So I was in the quite good cause. Um, um, besides that, the university also um, had a couple of events they did just for us, for us um, international students. So we had the welcome ceremony uh, beginning of September. Um, as the name already says, we have welcome ceremony, uh, then the international student gathering and the international cultural day. And the welcome ceremony was a ceremony to welcome all the international students. Um, I flew on the 4th of August to Indonesia. Uh, the welcome ceremony was one month afterwards. And the reason that it was this delayed is that they were waiting for all international students to come together. Uh, it was not just only those um, international students who are coming from a partnership university, uh, but also uh, Damasiswa students. They were studying culture and li um, languages in Atmajaya, then we had some who did an internship in, in Atmajaya, then we had those who are really studying for one or more semesters in Atmajaya. So all those international students were welcome in this welcome ceremony and we got also a t-shirt and we also got this tumbler, which I'm always drinking <laughs> of. So all this we got on the welcome ceremony, that was really nice. And um, one week afterwards, we had the international student gathering. Uh, that was more or less a gathering uh, where we had food, traditional Indonesian food. We were singing, dancing. And yeah, I didn't make any pictures <laughs> as you uh, might see. So I only have this one picture of me and John. It's an international student from Rwanda. Uh, yeah, and that was really also fun and a, 
in my opinion, a really nice idea to just get to know the different international students. And now let's open the curtain for the intern cultural International Cultural Day. So um, at first we were invited. Uh, the idea is that um, they have workshops, they have games, they have different languages there and they also want that the international students show something from their culture. For example, by showing dances, making, uh, producing food and that's why uh, one important issue is the food festival there. Um, we can a bit compare it with the World Food Festival at the ISV. So that's the idea. So me and Sarah, you can see it on the left picture, uh, we had to somehow think of a food, a cultural um, German food. At the end we were making Kartoffelsalat, a uh, salad out of potato. We made um, Apfelstrudel, a cake um, made out of apples <laughs> and a uh, klöße. Um, I don't think there was any translation for that. Um, yeah, and um, next to it we put a couple of spices, chili, just in case. For those who uh, don't like the klöße, then they can dip it into the chili. I saw also a couple of people who did that, um, you know, so that it's a bit more spicy, uh, maybe also more tasty. <laughs> So we were cooking and then we were heading to the um, International Cultural Day. Um, as you can see, Sarah is wearing her traditional Bavarian dress, the dindel. And me, uh, I was wearing my traditional northern style uh, with my Elbsegler, which you can see here. So um, like that, we were heading to the International Day. And for you to have some impression, um, we have this video. Mm. Here. What's the... Sorry. Somehow my internet got disconnected, I don't know why. No. So this is the after movie. And I want to show Mantap it to you. Mantap So this is um, uh, really not. this is the after movie of the International Cultural Day, which I wanted to show you. And let's continue. Okay, here. So um, I had a couple of friends who were just asking me then. Um, Hey, Lani, are you actually studying? Did you study there? Um, and the answer is quite easy. Yes, I did study. Um, I had, as every normal student, I had lessons. I had altogether four and a half. <laughs> I had participatory, participatory action research, change management, international business, sustainable green management, and, and it's the half point, um, Indonesian lessons. So, um, they have one sim similarity, we had presentations, we had to hold presentations, we had to write exams or essays, and uh, we also had to read books. So it was actually just a normal study, 
um, but using English as a um, ground base. But if you think it's it was just normal and that there was nothing extraordinary that's incorrect, um, there was this one class which was somehow different. And that class is PAR, Participatory Action Research. And that's a class um, where the idea is to have an inclusive class. We had um, Indonesian students, we had um, German and um, people from the Netherlands, and we had deaf people who can't hear. And we're trying, we were trying to make a class out of it. And to create this project, um, the aim was to empower all the students to somehow act, um, actively engage and also overcome this ba barrier, overcome this barrier of language and deafness. And um, that's why we had as a last task how somehow to also bound a bit more better. We had this task to um, have a weekend together. We were going uh, to a close community um, close to Magalang at the foot of Merapi, and we have we were there. And the task or the aim was that we should integrate into that community. We should join all the activities and we should um, follow the seminars. And through that, we were learning a bit more about the Merapi, uh, the volcano there in Jogja. Uh, we were um, making a trip up to a platform there, plateau. And we were also talking with one guide who was who's always guiding uh, there the Merapi, looking if there's any other volcanic activity and we learned more about the community uh, for example the community has one community leader his name is pa Citras and he was making his own movement dance and this movement is called um, Hash, Hash, Trabanta, Hash Trabanta and that's somehow a combination out of yoga and Tai Chi so he was showing us how to do it and he wanted us to learn it. The idea behind it is that he combined those two and included uh, different elements, water, uh, the earth and everything else. And one task was us to go, we had to go to the um, river, we had to sit there and we should somehow feel the movement, the flow of the water. And after that we should show how the which is flowing using our whole body. And as very last task, we had to do um, a hold a presentation, or not really a presentation, a demonstration. Think of an idea. And yeah, here you can see a couple of pictures. For example, on the top left, me crawling on the floor, um, or, the, or on bottom right, um, a girl being a bird. And yes, in the middle, you can also see Daffy. He's one of the deaf people. So that was uh, the class of ours. And uh, now let's go to one of my favorite topics, uh, the student organizations. And here you already see two of them. And before I talk about those two, I really want to tell you that if anybody is now here, who's thinking of going abroad, doing a semester abroad, I would advise you to join organizations because that's somehow a lifetime opportunity, a lifetime chance. You're going there, you're getting to know new people, you can integrate more, you're learning, getting to know the culture. And uh, that's much, um, I wouldn't say easier, but um, that's a, a real experience if you're doing that. And I can understand if you say, yeah, I want to go there, but I also want to travel, etc. But just imagine, you can go, you com can come back to Indonesia, for example, in five years. Then you can travel, do the things which you want to do. But you can't just come here and join, for example, Palava. You have to be a student for that. And that's why it's really extraordinary. And I would really advise everybody who wants to do something like that to also join student organizations and well as you can see I had this idea and I also did that and uh, the Atma Jaya has a lot of student organization they have an organization for radio 
they have basketball, they have video broadcasting, they have choir, they have Taekwondo Palava, they have really a lot. So I had to look at it and I had to think of, okay, what do I want to do? And at the end, I said, okay, I want to do something sportive, which I can also start a bit uh, faster. And then I decided to uh, join Taekwondo. And two months later, I decided to join Palava because they had then their introduction week. So I um, joined it and yeah, I really didn't, um, I really liked it. Um, to be honest, I wasn't sure if I can join Palava. I wasn't sure if they need somehow experience in what the activities are. Later I will tell you more about the activities. And um, I was also not sure if I can do it. Yeah, but at the end I tried it and I managed. And that's why I will recommend you all just try it, just ask. There's no fault behind asking. No? So um, next um, is my Taekwondo group. For this Taekwondo group, I have this jacket and you can also see my name engraved on it. Here. Lani Peters. I don't know if you can see it. So this is my Taekwondo jacket and I joined Taekwondo in OIJA. And I still remember my first time when I went there. Um, I was late. And late to be late is quite uh, normal in Indonesia. <laughs> but I was late and then um, Kafani, she came to me and then she was, um, she was asking me something. But I couldn't understand her because my Indonesian was not that good that I could understand and she recognized, oh, okay, she's not from Indonesia. And then she told me in English, um, yeah, well, you can now sit down, you can pray and then you can join us. Next thing that I did uh, was joining them and they would put me into the beginners. So I was doing Taekwondo and then they recognized, hey, mm, your movement, somehow you already did it once. And I said, yeah. And then they recognized I was shy. <laughs> Um, yes, I was shy and I, I admitted that I have the black belt in Taekwondo, but I was shy because I didn't do Taekwondo for ages. In my opinion, I was somehow a beginner again. Yeah, so that was my first time I met uh, this Taekwondo group and afterwards I was joining them again and again. I joined them and afterwards we ate quite a lot and uh, they asked me if I want to join a championship. At first I said, yeah, I would really love to join it. And afterwards I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure if I'm good enough. I wasn't sure if I can win. And then um, Palava, there was a Palava activity and I really wanted to join that Palava activity. And that's the reason why I didn't join the championship. Instead, I joined the Latian Alam Taekwondo UAJE. Uh, Latian Alam is translated to training in the nature and we were doing three main things first thing was training taekwondo training obviously second was eating or oh, the food was really good and the third thing was bonding so this bonding part had two activities the first activity was um, in a group and you can see it in the middle picture my group had uh, as activity or as task to combine Taekwondo and Chandol performance together with gendered music. Um, I think some people might not know it, uh, but it's somehow a typical Indonesian dance movement and I'm not talented in dancing. So I was just, why did we get it? Um, any task, but not this task. However, we d got this task and um, I'm proud to announce we were last place. <laughs> yeah, so um, the second activity was similar. We had a couple of group games. Uh, one of the games, for example, you can see on the picture is uh, Staffellauf. Uh, we had water and we had to fill that water. And on the way, the p different people were allowed to push you and then the water can obviously um, go out of uh, split and that was also a lot of fun and the funny thing is um, my group were again last place 
<laughs> so maybe it was my fault, I don't know. Um, well, during that time, uh, the, my Taekwondo friends were already telling me, hey, um, Lani, somehow you're really already a Palava person. You really love nature and that's quite true. During that time, during Latian Alam, I was already joining Palava and I was always doing um, Palava activities instead of joining Taekwondo. Um, but I want to just say here now uh, and tell you if there's any friend of mine from Taekwondo here. Um, I loved doing uh, to train with you all. So it was really a privilege for me and it was really a lot of fun. But somehow I always had to decide and then most of the time I decided for Palav, sorry for that. Yeah, um, now I told you quite a lot about Palava. So what is Palava? Um, Palava, uh, it's translated or in, in whole it's called uh, Pechinta Ala Masiswa, uh, which is or which are the nature lovers. And as the name already says, they do activities in the nature. So what are they actually doing? Um, in short, they're doing three things. First, theory. They're learning uh, things about the nature. They're learning how to, for example, climb. They learn, uh, for example, different knots. They learn holding different equipments needed, for example, for hiking or climbing, etc. That's the first thing, the th theory. The second thing is the practical stuff. For example, um, hiking, climbing, rafting, um, going into caves, exploring caves, all those things. And the third thing is they are caring for the nature. Um, here, you for, in the middle, you can see uh, at the top us carrying a sack. And we were going through Jogja. It was quite hot that day and we were um, collecting all the trash on the street, which we saw. So that was is also one activity which we are doing to somehow care for the nature and also help communities if possible. And here you see a lot of pictures with um, us wearing an uh, orange t-shirt. That's our t-shirt from the Lazar. Lazar, it's translated um, the basic training, the ground training. And I was joining this Lazar Tiga Enam, which is the 36th um, ground training, which they did. And uh, that's my group, if you can say it like that. So um, I was joining them and I was also joining the activities. And one of the activities was climbing. And you see me on the left side uh, hanging on a rope. And I can still imagine, I still remember uh, this situation. So um, I was there and there was this one sentence which I had to say. But my Indonesian was not that good during that time. Um, so I had to scream it and I screamed it and then I always did mistakes. So I will say it now a bit, um, but I won't scream. I will say it a bit louder. So don't be afraid if I, I'm a bit louder. So we had to say. Lapor nama lani latsar tiganam palava uje siap naik, which is more or less um, me saying, "Hey, my name is Lani. Um, I'm from Palava, uh, Palava uje, and I'm uh, ready to go up." The reason why we had to learn it and scream it is that um, you should imagine, for example, one person is in a cave down there, and there's a rope, and there's a second person up there. That second person up there has to somehow know, know that the person down there wants to now go up. Uh, yeah, so it's more or less um, screaming, telling the person up there, yeah, I'm now ready, I'm going up. Please don't go down. <laughs> so we had to learn it and that was quite a funny situation and embarrassing situation for me because I did it quite often wrong. Um, so. The thing is, um, I didn't join Palava just for fun. Um, yeah, if you look at the picture, it looks quite f a lot of fun. Although um, the picture on the right bottom, uh, we are doing uh, push-ups using our whole equipment. I'm not sure if that's fun. Is it fun for you? 
I don't know. Well, for me, it's fun. It was fun. Um, this maybe because I love challenges. So, um, however, it, it, that was not the reason why I joined Palava. The reason why I joined Palava is that I love nature. I love learning new things, new people, and I love challenges. So this was my personal challenge. My personal challenge to be active and to also learn Bahasa Indonesia. Um, my whole friends there were talking Bahasa the whole time. The whole theoretical things were said in Bahasa. And I was sitting there at the beginning not understanding a lot, but after a while, each time, each day, I learned and I understood more. And that's why I really want to thank Palava for that, that I was able to learn Bahasa better and to be also more fluent now. So um, on the left bottom picture, you see me going down to a flag. Uh, this is my promise to Palava. Uh, that was at the end, at the end of the whole Lazar. Um, we had to say a sentence which is Aku um, Menchinta Palava, which is translated I love Palava. And to be honest, this sentence is still correct. I really love Palava. I'm proud being a member of Palava and it's up until now. Or in this case, I'm not anymore member, but it doesn't matter. And after that, I also got a name. Uh, my name is this, Miros. Uh, Miros is an uh, abbreviation for Minum Teros, uh, always drinking. I don't think wrong, it's not about alcohol. Um, there was this one activity, it was about survival. And um, I was running there, I'm not really running, we had to go through some um, trees. And then I really want to drink and then afterwards I asked again if I'm allowed to drink and that's why um, Sarden gave me the name Miros because I was always drinking water and I drank a lot. <laughs> so that's the reason why I'm called Miros, this is my new Palava name. And after giving that promise that I love Palava and I would like to continue somehow being active in Palava, um, we were doing some other activities, uh, for example, hiking. So my first hiking tour was um, going to Gunung Sumbing. Um, you should know, um, if you want to become a member in Palava, a girl has to at least climb three um, mountains. And those mountains have to be a, a minimal 3000 meters high. And the guys, the men, they have to climb four mountains. So this is my first mountain. So I'm far off being a member that time. And uh, if you manage to climb three mountains, afterwards you have to write a report, uh, La Poran, and then you have an order examination, but that's still far away as mentioned. So this was my first hiking tour. And it's more or less like this, the structure. You're going there using the motorbi motor, uh, motorbike, um, two people on one motorbike. Afterwards, you sleep over in the base camp down uh, under the foot of the um, mountain. Uh, then you climb up the mountain. Uh, you sleep over close to the top at the last post, the last base camp. And then you go up again to the top the day afterwards. Uh, you do a couple of ceremonies up there. You make your pictures and then you go down again and then you can head back to uh, Jogja. So that's basically what we did. The thing is, there was this one situation which I didn't expect. Um, we were go hi hiking up and short before the last pause, short before us deciding, okay, we would now um, make our tent up there, build our tent. Short before that, it started to hail. There was really heavily hailing and it, it was, Unbelievable. I had my um, my poncho, and not poncho, what's the name? My raincoat, then I had my rain jacket, and all this didn't wasn't enough. I was wet. And that evening I was freezing like hell. It was so cold. I was just freezing. I couldn't sleep well. It was really not nice. And 
I was the whole time thinking, oh, I would love to cuddle now, but uh, I don't know that people yet that well, um, better net, and maybe they are also sleeping, but a day afterwards, I, I heard from them that they also didn't sleep well. <laughs> so that was um, a nice, but also not nice trip. And I won't forget it ever. <laughs> so um, I learned from that. And the second trip to Gunung Lavu, I was prepared, I was better prepared. I packed my um, my bag and I put a couple of more warm things inside. For example, a thicker socks, um, one pullover more. And at the end I didn't use it <laughs> because it wasn't that cold in Gunung Lavu. Um, yeah, that was quite funny. So I had more things with me, but I didn't use it, unfortunately. But at that um, in, um, in this hiking trip to Gunung Lavu, I had one task and I was the timekeeper. I had to write down when we arrived where and what time we went from one place to the next and how long it took. So I was keeping the time. You should know that um, if we go hiking, there are different um, tasks. Um, and one task is the timekeeper and the planner, for example, planning where are we going, which um, way are we taking. For example, here it's written via Chandi Cheto. So I, I was uh, the one deciding more or less, <laughs> or the others were also helping, of course. Then we have the task consumption. What are we eating? How much do we need? Who's buying it? And how much will it cost? And equipment, for example, tent, how many tents do we need? How many compers do we need? How many nestings? All those things. So uh, we have different tasks and we were learning from those tasks. And now I want to read something for you. So I can't see if you're doing it, but please uh, just close your eyes and listen to me. Um, <coughs> please close your eyes. Um, imagine you're full of power. Finally, you are on the top. Your eyes are looking around. What a beautiful surrounding. You're ser seeing birds. You're seeing, seeing the sun rising. Maybe you're also seeing people hiking up the mountain. And maybe you're seeing a couple of villages under the foot of the mountain. You're opening the palava flag. Afterwards, you're praying. You're praying, thanking God that you arrived up on the top, that you are here with the whole group, that you managed to do your second point. And then you're starting to sing. You're starting to sing the song, which doesn't want to work. Is it? So the song is now starting and you don't know the song, you don't know the title, but you're just singing with it. So the song is continuing um, and besides this song we are singing a second song which I won't play now. Um, so if you have this feeling you can imagine we are up there and then afterwards the pandemics, the people who are already active members who are helping you to go up there, uh, they will now say yeah welcome uh, you managed to do your second point and afterwards they are telling you so now do a couple of push-ups. <laughs> so here you see us again doing push-ups and each of the pen dumplings can tell you how many you have to do. I think that time we had to um, do 10 or so. Yeah. 
Um, so after that, and I think you can count, um, after two comes three. And actually I managed. Uh, I managed to now do three different hikes with Palava. And I had this crazy idea. I had this crazy idea. Uh, I want to show all my Palava friends that I mean it seriously. I take Palava serious and I'm not just this one girl coming from Germany being half German, half Indonesian, who just want to go there, do a couple of fun stuff and then I'm going bad and then back and hold the connection is again broken. No, I'm not such a girl and I wanted to show them that I take it seriously. So I had this idea of becoming a member. I told you before how to become a member. So this is my third um, mountain and this is also somehow a proof that I take it serious. So my last tour went to Gunung Agapuro and afterwards I wrote my report and then I had an oral examination and then uh, I also became a member in Palava. And there was this one guy who helped me quite a lot uh, to manage this because um, the last uh, hiking tour which you're doing to get your NRP, your NOMOR, uh, Palava, so you, you register every number so in order for you to become a member, um, you have to do it on your own. So you have to um, somehow plan the whole hike on your own and I was the only one there. So um, my friend Bungsu, he helped me quite a lot. Uh, he helped me, um, for example, gave me advices, how much food do we need, how is this whole way and yeah. Um, the thing is, um, I also had to do that all in Bahasa Indonesia. And also, I also had to calculate how much does it cost and where are we going. So um, at the end, we had the whole plan, thanks to also thanks to Bungsu. We had the whole plan and our friend Beap, he also joined. And we took the train to Probolingo, which is in East Java. So we are now more or less in the middle of Java and we went to East Java just for this trip. And um, to be honest, I can't tell you everything about this trip either. It was four days and it was extraordinary in my opinion. So um, my top three is first the nature. You can see it on the pictures. Um, Agapuro is unbelievably diverse. It has four different ecosystems. It has a tropical rainforest, which you can see on the picture. It has pine forest, it has savanna, and it has swamp areas. Um, I was counting just for fun the different, how many um, savannas we um, passed, and it were around 17, I think on the second and third day. So it was actually more. So you can see that it's really diverse. That's my top one, the nature. The second is friendship. Um, I already got to know Beap in books a bit, but our friendship was more bonding that through this trip. We were getting to know each other, we were making a lot of jokes, we were also um, swimming together in a, um, how do you say, in a river. And um, we were also talking until middle of the night, trying to find stars. Uh, yeah, so the friendship was somehow getting closer and closer. And the third thing um, is that this whole trip to Agapuro, or uh, in Agapuro, it's the longest trail for hiking in whole Java. It's around 60 kilometers, if I'm not wrong. And the reason why I chose it was that I had time. I said, I really want to do one trip, which is a bit longer, more than just one day. And we took this one, which was four days, taking four days. And we also managed. And I managed to become a member. On the second, 22nd of January, I had my oral examination and I got accepted as a member. And one week afterwards, I had to again fly back to Germany, uh, but it's another story. So um, back to Agapuro, I still want to mention one thing because right now you might have this picture. Oh, it was so perfect. There was so much nature. Um, well, that's true, but only partly. Oops, sorry. Here. Um, there was this one problem 
before we came there, the whole uh, Agapuro was closed. It was closed because it was too dry and the forest was burning. And here you can see a couple of um, examples. And we were passing and it was still burning a bit. And it was really sad because we were passing the woods. On the right, uh, there were trees flourishing, being green. And on the left, everything was just black and dead. So this is one real problem. I still imagine, uh, I still remember this one situation. We were coming down, we were already on our way back. And then we were entering the forest, which was actually no forest anymore. It was a bit dark. Um, there was everywhere fog and it was raining a bit. So we were entering it and everywhere the woods were burnt and it was dark and we were entering it and it was just a quite strange situation, a bit dangerous. It was not dangerous, but it felt dangerous and dangerous and also mystical. Yeah, and um, as you can imagine, if there's not a lot, uh, if it's hot, then there won't be a lot of water. Um, yes, on the first day, we uh, after we built our tent, Bungsen and I, we went down, we were searching for water. He was there already once and he told me, yeah, down there, down there, down there, there's a river. So we went there, searching for the river. And the river was no river, I mean, but it was just this little water left. And we didn't have much water left anymore. We had to take that water, we had to rinse it. Then we cooked it again, boiled it. And then we were allowed to drink it and we also uh, made our race with using this water. So you can imagine um, it's a huge problem, water. And the third thing is plastic. Um, the whole trip we didn't see a lot of plastic because there's not much civilization up there. But then we went down and suddenly there was this one street starting. And on that street at first it was clean, but afterwards there were left and right, there was everywhere plastic and trash. And here in the middle picture you can see Bungsu just doing with his hands like this, kind of asking how is it possible. And suddenly there's everywhere trash, so there's also this problem. Yeah, um, so as last activity I want to tell you a bit about my Goa experience. Um, Gore is more or less uh, translated cave and uh, there are two different kinds of caves. Uh, there's the horizontal ones and there's the vertical ones. And here are the pictures about, uh, from the horizontal cave which we were exploring. So as the name says the cave is horizontal. You're entering it somewhere and then you can go horizontal and then there's maybe water then you have to swim a bit and then you can continue again. Um, that was also quite fun um, and I think the most interesting activity we did in the horizontal cave was also to measure the cave. So we had our compass, we had our measure line, we had the clinometer and then at the end we had our whole data and we were making our whole picture of the cave. That was really interesting. But my favorite activity is the vertical. Goa, so the um, vertical ones going down. Uh, here you can see two examples. Uh, the left picture is from Goa Jomblang, which we were entering during our Tishe cave, uh, uh, not Tishe, during our um, Lazar. And here you can see that it went down, and at the end it was flat, so it went down, then it was flat, and then we were entering the horizontal cave. Uh, it was more or less a combination of horizontal and vertical cave. And the other cave, uh, which you can see on the other three pictures, is Goa Jati. And there we just entered the vertical one. So it just went down. So um, as you can imagine, we have to prepare ourselves. So you have to know, okay, how many meters does it go down? Um, you have to know the spot, you have to know where it is, you have to secure all ropes and then you can secure yourself and then you can go down. And we, are, we used the scanner so for each time we went up and we, we went down we were at least twice uh, secured. 
we had at least two safeties. And down there, as you can imagine, it was dark. So we had our headlamps in order to see something. And um, some friends of mine were just asking me, eh, isn't it somehow too dangerous? Don't you feel insecure doing it? And to be honest, yes, it is dangerous. It is dangerous if you don't know what you're doing, if you do it on yourself, on your own, if you don't have any equipment for that, then it's dangerous. If you, but if you know what you're doing, if you have the equipment, and if people are there with you can talk about this activity, and if they already, uh, and they also already uh, are experienced doing it, then it's safe. But um, still, um, things can happen. So um, there was this one important lesson I learned. If mistakes are done, it's not the mistake of the equipment, it's the mistake of a human. Human mistakes can happen. If somebody falls, it's a human mistake. It's not the equipment whose fault. So you can't say, hey, this equipment, that's his fault. No, it's the human. And the reason is that you have to prepare yourself. You have to plan the whole thing. You have to know the place, the time. And you also have to have a plan B. For example, um, if you're going there during rainy seasons, you can expect that it will start rain. And then you have to have a plan B how to come out again. And here you can see a plan on the left side of the cave. This is how it's looking. And... Um, I was attending this Tisha caving, the training center caving, and I learned there a lot. Furthermore, besides uh, the knots, for example, I learned how to um, um, prepare myself for the cage. Um, each evening we were preparing ourselves. We had to th uh, think, okay, how many meters long is this cave? How many ropes do we need? And then we had to count the ropes, then we had to check our carabina, how many we need. And we had to also check the rope. We had to go one by one through it, checking if it's safe, if it's not broken. The broken uh, part is called frixi in Vasa, Indonesia. And if there's a frixi, then you make a butterfly inside and then it's safe again. It's a special knot. So um, we had this situation uh, that two friends of mine were down. They were already downstairs in the cave and I was supposed to go down. I was I went over, down, down, down and suddenly I saw under me, oh, it's somehow a bit broken. So I was showing it up to our supervisor and they were just saying, oh, Miros, go up, um, I will have a look. So at the end, we had to exchange that rope because it was not safe anymore. And here you can see on the right hand side, the picture, what happened with the rope. If I would have gone down, uh, maybe something would have happened. Luckily, nothing happened. So you really have to know what you're doing and you have to always check. And I think that was definitely a human mistake. We were checking it, but we were maybe too tired. And then we didn't saw this frixie. But you have to be really um, careful. At the end, everything was okay and our friends went up again. Nothing happened. So the second thing which also happened was my fault. Um, I went down and suddenly the rope was finished. So I was still remembering the, uh, the notes of my friends. They said, uh, the place is too small for more than one, two people. Um, so go down first and check out the situation. So I went down and then I thought, okay, now this rope is already finished. Where's my place? I was looking left, right. I didn't say any spot which was somehow fitting. And then, um, yeah, I was, I went to the right. Uh, I unsecured myself. So at the end, I didn't have any safeties anymore. And I told my friends, okay, you can go down. So uh, a friend of mine, he went down and then he saw me there standing like this. It was really um, dangerous. Um, I was standing there and after a second, I actually recognized I'm definitely in the wrong spot. So I waited for my friend to go down. He saw me, he was really, what are you doing there? You're wrong. And the funny thing was, after he went down, suddenly there was rope coming from up. Our fault was we didn't put all the rope down. So that's, again, a human mistakes happening. And yeah, uh, 
I learned that uh, those are all human mistakes happening and I also learned that I have to listen to my first feeling. If I see, okay, this point is the wrong point, don't go there. But luckily nothing happened. As you can see, I'm still alive. So now we're going, coming to the end. Um, I had a lot of adventures um, and I was thinking, okay, how can I end this uh, whole presentation? And I'm ending it with, I am packing my suitcase and taking. So what I am taking, um, first of all, obviously uh, experiences. I learned so many things through Palava, through Taekwondo in my university and also through my living in Indonesia. Secondly, uh, the language. Um, not only Bahasa Indonesia, but also the R. Uh, this R, this R, uh, I couldn't pronounce it, but I learned it in, uh, in Indonesia. So that's one thing which I'm taking with me. Third, friends. Uh, this is a picture of the Teixe caving. Um, yeah, so all my friends, uh, they are really precious to myself and I would love to just pack them with me and come here. But as you see, uh, that's also not that possible. Third, uh, my Palava family, because I, it's not only any more um, friends, it's more than that, it's somehow a real family. And here you see myself as a secretary. And um, that was the situation where I was um, announced as a new member, by the way. <laughs> I'm now an alumni already because I'm not anymore starting in Atmajaya. Yeah, so I will take that one. And at last, um, if possible, I would take all the food I could get from Indonesia because I just love it. Uh, yet it's also somehow a bit difficult. So um, now it's somehow time to say goodbye um, and see you again. Sampai jumpa lagi in Bahasa Indonesia. Um, and I want to add, add with each end of a, um, a new story begins. Um, I told you the story that I was really interested. I, I had this dream of coming to Indonesia already during the primary school. And this dream came true now, but only because the dream is now finished, it doesn't mean that I can't follow any other dreams. Now my dream is to go back there and again to join Palava and other activities. So it's just continuing again. And for now, I hope that you somehow enjoyed my presentation. Uh, I don't know if at the beginning there were some technical problems, if it was switched off shortly, if if, what, if that was happening, then I'm really sorry for that. As an Instagrammer, I would now say, please like, share and post. But I'm not an Instagrammer. That's why I'm just saying thank you. Terima kasih. I want to say thank you to my friends in Indonesia, to everybody who now joined this um, presentation. Thank you to the ISVFO that I was allowed to hold this presentation. Thank you to iStuff and FEM who are now doing the streaming and helping with the whole technical equipment. Thank you to Theo Ilmenau and Atma Jaya that I had the opportunity to do this whole semester abroad. So actually, thank you to everybody. And now you can ask questions or comments. I will have a look in the chat and see if there's any question. I have to lock myself again. Sorry. I'm not a roboter. What? Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's fun. I have to lock myself in the chat first. Now I can start. Wow. 
ist, wenn ich Brust war. Wieso ist nicht? Aber ich muss ja die Farben angucken. Also jetzt. Okay, I see that there are a lot of SV people writing stuff. <laughs> But no question. Okay. Does anybody has a, pr a question? Otherwise, I think the presentation will be over now. <laughs> yeah, okay. I yeah. Have there been somehow dangerous situations or are there some things one should avoid to do as an exchange student? Um, Yeah, the, the dangerous situation I already told you about it, but that were my mistakes. I was joining Palava and there were a couple of things happening, but uh, it was always secure, luckily. There were, I wouldn't call them really dangerous, just some people call it dangerous. <laughs> and um, are there some things one should avoid as an exchange user? Um, Well, really avoiding things, I wouldn't say. I can just recommend you doing things, for example, that you should be open to the culture, open to the language that you are somehow trying to integrate, uh, um, interact there and also involve yourself there. That's the only thing which I can tell you about, but mm, somehow real to-dos or not to-dos. Yeah, well, there are some cultural not to-dos. And if that happens, normally you will find out if it's wrong or right. Yeah, okay. Is there any other question? Uh, no, people are saying beautiful presentation. Thank you for sharing your wonderful experience. Thank you very much, Red Panda. Uh, Hearty, also thank you. <laughs> um, I guess there are no questions anymore. In that case, I would now say thank you and see you again. Bye. Sampa <laughs> jumpa. There's a question? What did you like eating most? Ah, Red Panda, why? Uh, um, I can only tell you my favorite food is satay. Um, you might know it, it's so sticks and there is uh, meat on on top uh, i love it but i already loved it before i went to indonesia and to be honest the best satay is still the satay of my mom um yeah what do you do when you miss indonesia what i do um i'm writing my friends <laughs> so sometimes i randomly write for example shemong or monang or bungsu so If you miss me, you can just write. <laughs> okay, bad joke, sorry. Kapan mau ke Indonesia lagi? Monang. So she was asking, um, when do I want to go back to Indonesia? As soon as possible. Uh, for now, my plan is to do my bachelor thesis, finish it this year. Uh, no, no, not, not this year. Um, I'm starting at end of this year, then I still have my Uh, practical my internship so maybe before my master or after my master that's my plan uh, what was your biggest challenge during the exchange semester um, the first month it was a real challenge um, I didn't knew people and there was also no organization yet where I could go to As mentioned, the Taekwondo was starting one month afterwards and the Palava two months afterwards. So the first month was quite lonely and that was my biggest challenge because I just didn't know what to do and I was a bit lonely. Yeah, I guess um, somehow to be there first. Tripti. 
What's the most cultural shock for you? Sorry, Tripti, I don't have a cultural shock. Uh, in my opinion, that's somehow a uh, part of me. I know a lot of people say I'm German, but me myself, I'm saying I'm half German, half Indonesian. I'm proud of it. And I saw going there that my mom influenced myself. Um, I didn't have cultural shock. I was somehow already a bit used to it. And I was also quite happy that I was able to um, fast integrate in, the, in everything. Queen Tiara. Are you not fluent in Indonesian? I have to um, lie if I would say I'm perfect. Um, if people are talking with me, yes, I understand it quite fluently. And I also can speak fluently in my opinion, but, and that's the thing, I also do a lot of mistakes. And yeah, I would say it's fluent, but it's not mother tongue yet. Who knows? Maybe it will be my mother tongue. <laughs> it's, I think it's depending on the definition mother tongue. <laughs> my favorite sauce for satay, um, peanut, peanut sauce. Thank you, Chekak. I miss you too. Would you like to work in Indonesia in the future? Oh, that's quite a personal question. Um, I thought of it and to be honest, I would, but um, I will see um, what will come also with my boyfriend and everything. So that's why I said it's personal. Did you have fear of vulcano erupting in the middle of the night? <laughs> Actually, that's a funny story. Uh, there was Merapi once erupting. Uh, it was not in the middle of the night, it was middle of the day and it was also not that dangerous. I wasn't there during that time, but my friend, uh, she was filming it <laughs> while watching the Merapi erupting a bit. I wasn't afraid. Um, Indonesia now has already a lot of technic uh, technologies um, already how do you say it? Um, they can find beforehand if a volcano is erupting or not. Hal yang tidak bisa kamu lupakan saat kamu di Jogja. Guest 34 was asking um, which thing I couldn't um, forget about since I was in Jogja. Yeah, Palava, to be honest. <laughs> and I really miss it each day here. Will you be part of the ISV team during ISV 2021? <laughs> well, guess 38. Um, I will be a super helper, but I will also do my internship during that time. In that case, uh, I, it won't be able, I won't be able to um, coordinate anything or, yeah. Did you miss beer? Uh, yeah, I m missed beer in Indonesia. Somehow the German beer is better and it's not even, yeah. Actually, I'm, I missed Rata. <laughs> That's quite a stereotype, right? <laughs> Hati can only think of food, oh God. What do you love the most from Indonesia? Um, right now I miss coming together with friends and to do the whole activities which we did, for example, just eating together, um, going out, hiking, exploring um, caves, all those things. I just miss that. I know I can still meet here, but because of the Corona situation, everything is a bit difficult and obviously last big activity which I did was in Indonesia, that's why I'll miss it. All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, which country do you want to go for next exchange and why? Uh, Tripti, I'm not thinking of that right now. Right now I'm thinking of doing my bachelor thesis and afterwards my master. And let's see, 
um, I don't have any plans of any country any uh, right now. Waiting to have you around anytime soon and spicy food. <laughs> okay, uh, that's a good ending. Um, see you all and thank you very much for joining this uh, Wanderlust lecture. What can we learn from Indonesians? Um, you can be late and still manage things. That's what you can learn. <laughs> and thank you very much for the presentation. Cheers from Kiel. Uh, cheers from Ilmenau and bye bye. <laughs>